as I mentioned, uh, Nicola uh, had 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 given a version of this talk, I think, in 20, 2013, I think it was, for, for uh, our, our friend uh, Tim Wang's Macro Cities conference here. Uh, and a number of Long Now members, staff uh, saw it and got really excited about it. And we, um, while it took a little while to get her to speak here, she has been hard at work going deep on this subject. And uh, we now have the benefit, actually, I think of the first time she's spoken about this for a while because she's been so working so hard on researching the book. The book is coming out next year. We're getting a little sneak peek at it tonight. Um, Nicola Twilley is uh, a writer known for uh, her long running blog, Edible Geography. She's also co founder and co host of the Gastropod podcast. Uh, and uh, her writing appears in publications like The Atlantic, New York Times Magazine, and The New Yorker regularly. Um, and tonight, uh, we have her here to tell us about the artificial cryosphere. A big round of applause for Nikki, Nikki Coy. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys, for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, I have a simple goal. Well, I, I have a few goals. I mean, uh, I'd like to not completely embarrass myself, trip over, forget to breathe, choke, all sorts of goals like that. But my main goal for you all is to uh, reintroduce you to your refrigerator. <laughs> you have one, I'm a bet, because 100% of Americans do, basically. A government data is so close as to make no difference. In fact, if uh, if the statistics are right, a quarter of you in this room have two or more. So you you are familiar with the item about which I speak, but you may not have given it much thought. Um, maybe you occasionally think, "Ugh, I have to clean it." Uh, if you work at home like me, you might open it in search of inspiration on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> If you work in, a, in an office, it might be the site of some low-level, passive-aggressive behaviors. Uh, if you're unlucky, it might have broken down. Maybe the day before Thanksgiving, that's always a good one. But you, what you won't have appreciated is that your refrigerator is actually a portal um, a, into a magical space that I call the artificial cryosphere, where the normal laws of time and space are suspended and your food lives in an eternal winter. So <laughs> that is, that, this, is, this is a place we built for our food to live in, and it's, uh, it's where I'm taking you tonight. The fridge, your fridge at home, is literally the tip of an iceberg. So... The, uh, the United States is the most refrigerated country in the world. We have more than 100 million cubic meters of thermal control. That means nothing to me, but once I did the math, and it is actually not so much smaller than the Arctic. So basically, we've <laughs> built a third pole for our food to live in, which is incredible. And um, then, you know, all these separate refrigerated spaces are connected by a cold chain. So you end up with this sort of seamless, um, you know, monument of, of engineered winter. And uh, the thing that happened to me is that I realized I'd been writing about food for a decade at this point, when I first sort of turned my attention to the cold chain. And, and I realized I had visited farms and I had visited factories. And obviously, I had talked to chefs, and I had, I had even been to the grocery store on occasion. But I had never been inside a refrigerated warehouse. And I, I'm going to guess most of you haven't either. Um, and here we are in the Bay Area, which, you know, home of farm to table. But it, it, that to word, it goes via the refrigerated warehouse. <laughs> like, in between farm and table is a giant cold space that nobody thinks about. So um, I decided to explore it. Um, and 
first of all, I partnered with the Center for Land Use Interpretation, which um, those of you who haven't heard of it, you are in for a treat when you Google it later. Um, but we mapped the American cryosphere. And, uh, and then I still wasn't done. So then I uh, wrote a piece for the New York Times Magazine that took me to China to explore their artificial cryosphere. Um, and then I still wasn't done. So then I uh, decided to sell a, a book on this topic and, and research that and write that. And that is still not done. But that's a, that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, so uh, I have gone deep into this uh, artificial cry cryosphere. And my goal tonight is say, let, let's go on a quick spin through this space, past, present, future. Um, and uh, I have, so I hope you wrapped up warmly. We are stepping inside. And I want to start this thing right with a banquet. Um, so <laughs> uh, this, uh, in its time, was the most talked about meal in the United States. Um, the organizers had originally booked quite a small room. They had to upgrade to the largest banqueting hall in Chicago. The guest list kept expanding. Uh, a member of Congress decided they wanted to come. Then other members of Congress decided they wanted to come. People were, were flooding this. And, and so wh what is so special about this meal, you ask yourself? Well, this was the world's first cold storage banquet. Everything on the menu had been stored under refrigeration. So, except I should point out for the olives in the dry martini, not <laughs> refrigerated. So this, is took, this took place on Monday, October 23rd, 1911. Um, there's, a, there's, you know, thousand people in the room, white linen, you know, full table service, the crystal out. Um, the, the result was two hours of what industry journal The Egg Reporter called unalloyed pleasure. Um, so <laughs> and, and what is amazing about it is that everything on the menu had spent at least six months and up to a year in cold storage. Um, and, and what I love about this menu too is, and again, you know, here in the Bay Area, we are used to seeing who grew are, uh, you know, oh, this is Mary's chicken, um, or this is like this particular heirloom variety of tomato. Do we ever see what cold storage it was in? We do not. <laughs> Here, we have Booth's cold storage, proud, you know, uh, the last address of that salmon. And, uh, and so the, that, was, that was sort of, uh, uh, and, and the sort of introduction to the meal explained, well, uh, your turkey, that's 11 months old. Uh, your eggs, seven months. Um, the, the president of the Natural, National Poultry Butter and Egg Association, who was kind of giving this introduction, said, uh, your capon received its summons to the great unknown last Valentine Day. <laughs> so um, the, the pie, even the pie, cold stored flour. Uh, butter churned in June, apples, and this is October, so they, they could have had fresh, but no, they'd been in storage alongside the salmon at Booth's for a year. Um, the head chef of the hotel where this was being served said, a man called Lucien, there has never been a better meal served at this hotel. Um, the San Antonio uh, reporter, Express, whatever, the journalist from there said, nothing was quite fresh. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, the poultryman, the president of the Poultryman Association said, this is edible proof that cold stored foods are not only good, they're better than the ones that you would eat fresh. And the congressman, who was called upon to sort of speak, agreed and said, yes, um, I really believe that there is more flavor to cold storage poultry than the kind that is advertised as freshly killed. And he said, I'm going back to Washington, I'm telling the folks, cold storage is where it's at. So this, this, this kind of lunch became a, a national trend. So LA held the next one, then there was one in Detroit, there was one in Philly. Two years later, there was another one in Chicago with literally thousands of people and a special three-page souvenir brochure with not only where 
the food had been stored, but also the temperature and relative humidity of where it had been stored. So it became a trend. And, um, and this is barely more than a century ago. So today, more than three quarters of everything in America has either been stored or processed or shipped under refrigeration. So you would actually have a harder time eating a meal that wasn't cold stored than one that was. So it, it's kind of amazing to me that, that, you know, how to understand why this meal caused a national flutter less than, uh, more than, only just more than 100 years ago. And so to understand that, you really have to under, well, you have to be able to imagine life pre-refrigeration. And uh, so life without artificial refrigeration is obviously most of humanity's existence. And the, the challenge is that the things that make us like food, which is that it's full of nutrients and water, are also the things that make it really attractive to bacteria and fungi. And when they eat our dinner first, we call that rot. And, and um, we find it upsetting. And, and so watching, watching food rot is, is horrifying, in part because for most of history, it was existentially threatening. Um, but it's also kind of mesmerizing. And I will say, again, for your amusement later this evening, there is a lot. There's, there are entire YouTube channels of food rotting. Um, <laughs> like different, I took this screenshot, the next suggested autoplay video was the cult favorite rotting sausage, which I did not <laughs> include a screenshot for, and you can thank me for that later. Um, but uh, but it, is, it is strangely fascinating. Actually, one of my favorite um, uh, moments uh, of, of rotting research was that in 2011, the entirety of the British Isles basically tuned into what was, to, to what was called the rot box on, on the BBC. And uh, the, this, <laughs> this makes it sound like some country that got TV about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the BBC is a fine institution. But <laughs> what they did was put a bunch of food on a soundstage at Edinburgh Zoo and then Essentially, the entire British public spent two months in the summer of 2011 watching the food rot in uh, real time. And then there were like televised, you know, check-ins on what had happened, you know, as the kind of vegetables collapsed on themselves and the chicken kind of bloated and, and then started leaking and the maggots hatched and, and <laughs> etc. So. Rot for most of human history has been a, 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 mi a mystery as well as a feared enemy. Uh, 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 many of you will know that, um, you know, it was so sort of, it was held up as the sort of, the, the, the central kind of plank in the theory of spontaneous generation because otherwise how could life emerge from nothing? Well, look at the maggots on a piece of meat. Um, it took Louis Pasteur to disprove that. But, um, but figuring out how to stop the rot it has been essentially sort of one of the primary focuses of human ingenuity for most of history. And our earliest experiments in biological warf warfare and the source of some of our most delicious foods. So you have things like drying, you have salting, you have pickling, you have... Um, all of these kind of things that give us the delicious, uh, salty, smoky, sour, fermented, funky things that are what is good about eating for the most part. And those, that, th those flavors, that's the signature of pre-refrigeration cuisine, I like to say. It's, it's like this is, this is um, the best thing going in a world full of monotonous grain, you know? These kind of flavor bombs, not only had you saved the food, you'd banked the harvest against the lean season, you'd made it portable in a lot of cases, and it tasted amazing. I mean, this is like humanity's uh, greatest triumph. There's a, um, but, but, but underlying it, and I feel like I will never look at cheese the same way again, is this, the, the, once you realize, it's, it's like this sense of incredible uh, 
um, urgency. There's an Italian historian who has a quote that I love that, that, that says, uh, preserving is anxiety in its purest form. <laughs> and I, that's, that's cheese. Um, so <laughs> so uh, these things are great. But what they are not is they are not the same as fresh, right? No one is going to mistake uh, smoked salmon for fresh fish. No one is going to mistake a pickled uh, cabbage for a fresh one or uh, cheese for milk or anything like that. You know, the things you have to do to, you know, the scorched earth policy of getting rid of the microbes, that also changes the flavor and the texture and the appearance of the food. Um, so refrigeration changes all that. There's this the new, the, 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 the systematic widespread use of coal to preserve food is, is basically an entirely new chapter in human nutrition. You overcome seasonality, you overcome geography, and you've stopped the rot. So uh, obviously, um, well, first of all, a thing that I learned embarrassingly late in my refrigeration research, uh, cold is actually just the absence of heat. All of you know that, I know, but I didn't. <laughs> so, so while humanity has known how to add heat to food for a really long time, removing heat turns out to be very challenging. And so uh, humans had noticed that cold had the power to stop time. And actually, some of the first ice houses are 4,000 years ago along the banks of the Euphrates. Um, ancient Romans and Greeks would purchase ice carried down from the mountains to chill their wines and things like that. Um, in the 1600s, uh, th this is another kind of rabbit hole, but uh, ice sort of had a, a trend in England to, to chill custards and jellies and things like that. And uh, so a lot of fancy houses had, had ice houses elsewhere on their property. And uh, there's a theory that I love that the pervasive myths, myths about hobbits and little people dwelling underground in England is because of all the ice houses, because <laughs> they usually kind of set away from dwellings and their little doors into little like round circles. And, and um, yeah, so hobbits or ice houses, you, you decide. But, um, but obviously this was not, uh, these are not reliable widespread kind of systems of cooling. And, uh, and it actually, it, it took a 23-year-old uh, a um, Bostonian called Frederick Tudor to turn natural cold into a global industry. Uh, in 1805, he got started. Um, and he, in, in the next 50 years, he developed the tools, which you can kind of see in operation up there. Um, he developed a global network of ice houses. You can, again, sort of see the scope of the trade. Um, he developed the most ingenious business model. So the, the ice trade sort of worked on the basis that ships often needed a ballast on their way out and were then going to bring stuff home to American consumers. So you could ship out the ice and bring stuff home to America. Um, it was off season for the farmers who owned the ponds, so they were happy to harvest in the winter. They had nothing, nothing else to do. Um, and there was an amazing tax loophole, right? Uh, the IRS couldn't uh, classify ice harvesting as either mining or farming, so they just ignored it. So, <laughs> so he absolutely coined it. Um, and by uh, 1900, uh, the ice industry employed 90,000 people and was worth 220 million in today's money. It was. North America, because it had so much fresh water and so much cold, it was considered sort of like the Saudi uh, of, of, you know, this resource, you know, like, like Saudi oil is today, our ice was then. Um, and then by 1930, this has completely disappeared. So um, this, I actually went to an ice harvest up in Maine. It's one of the few ones that still happens. It was very popular the particular year I went because Frozen had just come out. And so 
a lot of people bringing their kids. <laughs> um, and then they sell the ice blocks on an honor system to fishermen who prefer it because it melts more slowly than artificial ice because there's fewer air bubbles in it. Um, and then they blow whatever is left in July on a giant ice cream social that I happened to go back for, so that was kind of fun. But, <laughs> but what is, so the, the, the uh, natural ice industry is fascinating, but we'll, how it relates to the artificial cryosphere is that what became, what had started as a as sort of a decadent thing. This was this ice was used for chilling um, cocktails or uh, uh, you know uh, sort of ice cream and things like that. It ended up kind of proving that there was a business model for cold. There was a demand. There was a global demand and a commercial value for preserving the food. And that really inspired a whole generation of uh, inventors to, to master artificial cold, because they saw you can make money from natural cold, so let's get on this. Um, so they do, eventually, and any of you who um, are familiar with the sort of stories of how a new technology gets started will be familiar with how difficult this is. There's getting it to work. There's scaling it up. There's making it economic. You know, how could, for, for, for most of the 1800s, it could not compete at all with all of the 1800s, it couldn't compete with natural ice, um, it's too expensive. So what happens? How does, the, how does uh, artificial cold take over? Well, during the Civil War, the South was cut off from northern ice. So, the, so inventors took a, took a chance there to um, uh, build some prototype ice factories. Um, but really what happened was lager Primarily, there were a lot of German immigrants. Americans went from drinking not very much beer to much, much more beer. And you cannot make lager beer without consistent cold temperatures. So that led to a huge investment in uh, refrigeration technology. Um, then uh, the, the next big driver is pollution. Right? We had all these nice fresh waterways. The Hudson used to give New York all of its ice. And then uh, as the cities scale up and the rivers are used as open sewers, the ice that comes out of them is no longer <laughs> so fresh and pleasant. Um, and natural ice starts to look a lot more attractive. Um, widespread electrification is obviously a driver, obviously helps. The discovery of vitamins plays a huge, or what you will all call vitamins, uh, plays. <laughs> a huge role. Uh, so previously, things like, so this happened in the early years of the 1900s. Uh, previously, things like lettuce had been seen as like, that's nice and decorative, but what is the point? Which some people still, still share that. Um, but once, you know, vitamins had been discovered, everyone was like, oh, we actually need fresh fruit and vegetables. There's a purpose to these things. They're not just kind of decoration. So, uh, and, and vitamania sort of swept the nation, so that led a huge huge demand. Um, and then the kind of final push over the edge was prohibition. Um, so all these beer makers who have invested absolutely shed loads in their ice making equipment to fulfill America's desire for lager beer are suddenly not able to make and sell their lager beer. So they're like, what shall we do? So they start using their refrigerated equipment for food. And then Americans get used to it. So uh, the one I love is uh, Bush the beer company of fame. Um, they got in the frozen eggnog business during pro <laughs> Prohibition and also developed a very popular ice cream bar called Smack. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so these are the forces that made artificial refrigeration sort of actually kind of break through. The natural ice industry kind of melted away as if it had never existed. Um, and, uh, and America becomes used to, to cold. But there's still this user resistance, and that brings us to the era of these cold storage banquets. People just didn't, they, they saw cold store foods as zombie foods. I mean, what kind of unnatural technology could make a chicken, a two-year-old chicken, look the same as a just harvested, ch it just, I mean, that's just not right, right? That's not, I mean, if you were, you know, if you actually think about it, 
that's freaky. So, <laughs> and they, and, and if you, th people, you know, they had a way of thinking about food. There was a known physics of freshness that had to do with seasons and time and geography. And all of a sudden, those rules were broken and they did not understand the new reality. So you get a situation where people, you know, have to take out ads. Cold storage eggs are good. Um, there are big national debates uh, with, you know, doctors on either side. Cold storage foods are bad. They will, you know, uh, disrupt the delicate nervous system, etc. No cold storage foods are good, etc. Um, uh, people built their cold storage warehouses to look like banks or fortresses, like safe places to put your food and save it. Um, whereas nowadays, they're like boxes on the edge of town that, that no one is supposed to look at. Um, so <laughs> there was this, and, and, and it was so successful that now, I mean, people... It, oh, the, my favorite thing is it, it became a sort of named medical disorder, frigorophobia. <laughs> so, may, it's sort of a rabbit hole I went into the book. But they were so successful that now um, people don't think things are fresh if they don't have to go in the fridge. There, there's, there's a mistrust of things that don't come from the fridge because how could they be fresh? And we rely on a sell-by date, which is a, you know, sort of a refrigeration-driven innovation to tell us whether something's fresh rather than our own understanding of kind of how freshness works. Um, and when, uh, say, silk soy milk was introduced, they paid extra to be shelved in, a refrigerate, in the refrigerated section of the supermarket rather than on the, on the regular shelves, even though it's a perfectly shelf-stable product, because people would not think it was fresh if it did not have to be refrigerated. So it's sort of gone 180 in that quick of a time. Um, so, the book goes sort of step by step through the, uh, the evolution and, and impact of various bits of uh, refrigeration technology. So the invention of the charmingly named reefer, which is a refrigerated container. Um, and this, this lady who uh, spent her 20s living in a shipping container to try to figure out um, how to make this, this technology work. Um, she still works in refrigeration. <laughs> and it goes through kind of what happens to different foods, so how the invention of refrigerated, they're called tank farms for orange juice, turns this very perishable thing into something that is a breakfast drink for, you know, 20% of Americans. Um, and, and become, you know, orange juice goes from something that's freshly squeezed at home, very variable, very perishable, into something that can be a brand. It tastes the same, Tropicana can taste the same every time, and that's different to Minute Maid, because you're storing it in a giant tank and you can regularize the flavor. It also turns it into a financial instrument. You might be wondering why I would put a <laughs> picture trading places up there, but uh, for those of you who don't remember, the <laughs> climax of this fabulous movie involves uh, trading orange juice futures. So something as per perishable as orange juice can become a financial instrument all of a sudden. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, re while refrigeration is changing where things are grown, how we, how we buy it, how it gets to us, what it tastes like, it's also reformatting the landscape. This is a feedlot, uh, and it's an aerial photograph uh, photograph by a photographer called Mishka Henner. And, um, and that, doesn't, that landscape makes no sense without refrigeration, obviously. You, you can call that a landscape of, of corn. Michael Pollan would call that a landscape of corn, but it's also a landscape of refrigeration. It does not make any sense to have a feedlot without refrigeration. Um, the other thing that I like is, you know, of course, because we are what we eat, we have been reformatted by refrigeration too. Um, so there are pe folks hard at work at figuring out what the refrigeration microbiome is, how our refrigerated diet changes our microbiome. But there are some Duke University researchers who figured out that of all the sort of shifts in public health and, and all sorts of things over the 20th century of, uh, that have changed added height to Amer the average American, a full quarter inch of that is down to refrigeration. <laughs> so they have an extensive paper. It's, uh, 
it, it is an amusing read. Um, but yes, a quarter inch. You can thank refrigeration for a quarter inch of your height on average. Um, so in the US, all these changes took place mostly in the first half of the 20th century, a, a little beyond. And so they're basically invisible to us now, which is why we look at our food system and we think it's normal. But we're actually seeing a, a, a food system that is completely distorted by refrigeration. And What's interesting is if you go to a place that has only just refrigerated or is still refrigerating, you can see those shifts take place, which is why I went to China um, to visit the, uh, the, the factory of the frozen dumpling mogul um, who brought frozen food to China. This is the frozen dumpling factory. He was a surgeon, and when Deng Xiaoping said, oh, you know, um, uh, some people are going to get rich. M this surgeon decided he would like to be one of those. And so he uh, harvested some parts from some of the hospital machinery and built a freezer system. He, he was already famous in the neighborhood for his homemade dumplings, and he just started a, um, a dumpling factory. Um, but what's amazing is when you go there, you can see the same things play out that played out here. So. There was initially a very intense distrust, and there still is amongst a certain generation when I talk to folks about could, could uh, refrigerated and frozen food be good? Could it really be okay? And, uh, and the frozen dumpling mo mogul told me that um, actually the drip right there on the dumpling is very important. That signified freshness. They tried to sell the dumplings in a, in a package without the drip, and, and, and they weren't selling, and the drip somehow sort of communicated a freshness to folks. Um, you can, um, I visited f people who are, re who are breeding Chinese vegetables to be, be cold storage tolerant, so their vegetables are changing in real time. Their diets are changing. Where things are grown is changing, so there's a big Chinese government project called the South to North Vegetable Transfer that is shifting <laughs> where things are grown. These are Chinese apples going out to the world. Um, it's changing where, where food is sold. So wet markets are turning into Walmarts. And that changes how often people shop. It changes the layout of their houses. It changes the layout of cities. So you could see all of those things kind of changing in real time. And what's crazy about China is, so in 2010, the Chinese government said, uh, made refrigeration part of their 12th five-year plan. They were like, we are going to refrigerate. And being China, they just did it. And so <laughs> it has, in the past 10 years, the amount of refrigerated space in China has uh, m grown by more than 20 times. It is, it's just exploded. Um, and yet still, Chinese people have less than a third of the cold storage space of an average American per capita. So it's still happening. And it's happening now in India, and it's happening with Chinese funding in Africa. So the world is refrigerating at, at speed. And a lot of people are like, well, this is a good thing, right? Because diets improve. People have access to fresh vegetables and dairy and more animal protein. That's exciting. Farmers. Uh, are not stuck selling all their harvest when it comes in. They can export, they can make money, they can, um, they don't, and, and, and then the big thing that people say is, well, food waste, right? When you don't have a cold chain, you lose a lot of food. So in a country like India, where there isn't a robust cold chain, um, estimates are that, a, that at least 40% is lost before it, you know, at the farm stage, basically, before it ever gets anywhere close to the consumer. In America, where we have uh, an amazing cold chain, well, we waste 40% on the consumer end. <laughs> so the cold chain, people, refrigeration boosters like to say it prevents food waste. But I think it's a little more nuanced than that. It kind of just shifts where it happens. Um, it maybe makes it easier to fix. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, th this actually strikes me as harder to fix in a lot of ways. But so that... But that brings me to sort of the final chapter of my refrigeration book, which is this fabulous irony that building an artificial cryosphere has basically uh, led to the, the certain end of our natural one. <laughs> um, because uh, 
it's, um, so at the moment, currently, the energy required for cooling is a sixth of uh, the global electricity burden. That's all cooling for buildings, but, you know, people too, so not just food. Um, no one has broken it out by just food. But still, that's a lot. Um, and then imagine, okay, even if all, uh, all of the energy used to refrigerate was uh, renewable, uh, which it's not, even then, you have the problem of refrigerants, which are a gigantic problem. Um, normally, these are the liquids that actually do the heat exchange process in a refrigerator. Um, the ones that are very popular, particularly in the developing world, are called HFCs. They're called super greenhouse gases because they are thousands of times more warming than carbon dioxide. Um, and if current trends in refrigerant usage continue, Experts uh, say that these HFCs will be responsible for half of global greenhouse emissions by 2050. So that's not going to happen because people have, people have agreed to scale back their use of these HFCs and switch to other um, refrigerants that are less damaging. But still, you can see this is a giant problem, and the UN has just woken up to it last September, I went to speak at the first meeting of the Sustainable Cooling for All meeting at the UN. And the idea was we are, the cooling is great, we need cooling, but how are we going to provide it sustainably? Uh, well, can that be done? Uh, should it be done? This is how, so these, these are the questions with which I end my book. And I think there are a few ways to think about this problem and, and what the future of refrigeration should look like. So one is, okay, the technology is problematic, let's reinvent the technology. Um, and, th and that's the direction that most effort is going into, and obviously there are some really smart people, there's, you know, there are people, there's a, there's a guy in a, a British guy who was in a shed with a lawnmower and a can of antifreeze and has invented a refrigeration engine that is like zero emissions and uh, is being trialed by Sainsbury's at the moment. So there are obviously, you know, great steps being made in that direction. But I also feel like just designing better refrigeration technology misses the point a little because this is something that redesigned our entire food system. It redesigned us. It redesigned the landscape. It redesigned, uh, you know, our in, our entire the layout of cities, the layout out of our homes, the taste of our food. It redesigned a lot of things, and maybe it, this is a good moment to think about: well, if we're going to refrigerate the whole world, is that the system that we want? Could we do better? And um, and so there are a couple of things that I just want to leave you with. Uh, because it's always good to be like, could we do better, and then turn it over to the audience <laughs> to answer that question. But um, <laughs> one is, uh, I think we need to think thermally, right? Um, cold is a resource, um, and we could choose not to waste it. So um, waste heat recovery gets a lot of play these days. What about waste cold recovery? Um, that's starting to be looked at at ports with liquid uh, natural gas. When you regasify that, you you throw off a lot of cold that is currently just thrown away. But what else is at ports? Food is at ports. You could be cooling that food with your spare cold. We don't even think of cold as a spare thing at the moment. Um, it's also uh, this is in Japan. Um, they've started a snow cooling project in Hokkaido, and they uh, cool uh, rice warehouses using snow. They figured. You know what? We are spending money to collect the, like, plow the streets, store the snow, and then get rid of it in the spring, uh, often dumping it in a river and polluting the river with all the road salt and all the crap that the snow has got in it. Um, and so instead, they pile it up in these, uh, in these sort of 10 meter high snow drifts, and it keeps the rice at 4 degrees centigrade and um, 70% humidity, which the rice really likes, and then they sell it under the Snow Mountain brand, and it's great. They have, 100, they have 140 of these in this region. So it, uh, it's kind of, that, I thought that was kind of a, you know, why not? There are a lot of places with a lot of snow. They're just spending a lot of money to try and get rid of it. Um, there's also, uh, so that's thinking thermally. There's also kind of, uh, 
I want to pick up on that idea of, uh, I just have that there because I like it. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about it, I just want you to enjoy it. But there's, <laughs> I want to pick up on that thing that I said about the, the rice liking 70% humidity. So a lot of our food, it turns out, doesn't actually like the refrigerator very much. Um, and uh, for example, Tomatoes, if you store them in a snow-cooled room, they have higher lycopene, they have higher beta-carotene levels. If you store asparagus in a snow-cooled room, it, it lasts two weeks longer on average. Food likes, fruit and vegetables in particular, like humidity, um, and that is not what you get in a mechanically refrigerated room. And so actually, what I think is interesting about this is, well, there's an opportunity to think about this system from the point of view of the food, um, and what, what would it like? We built this system for it. Maybe, it, maybe, maybe we could rethink it from the point of view of the food. Um, and, and so this is a fun uh, student project um, that I like because it does take into account what um, fruits and vegetables prefer. So this is just one aspect of it, which sort of has got the sort of the nightshade family and their their love for humidity. I also think if you're if you're uh, I want to call it an aubergine. What is it called? <laughs> eggplant. If your eggplant is stored on a shelf on your wall like that, would you forget about it and let it rot? You would not. So <laughs> design from the point of view of the food, design thermally. And then the final kind of thought is, well, you know, maybe the arc of food preservation technology that kind of goes from drying to pickling and to, to canning to refrigeration, maybe it's not over. And so when I first sort of thought, maybe I'll write a book about refrigeration, I did the smart thing, which was to look and see if anyone else had written a book about refrigeration. And obviously, there are a lot of really boring textbooks about refrigeration. But uh, the last popular book for a popular audience uh, was written in 1953. Um, it's called The Refrigerated World or something. And uh, slim, slim book. Um, and I went to the library, and I read it. And, uh, and the guy who wrote it, his final page is, well, you know what? Th th all things pass, and I expect very shortly refrigeration will be replaced, maybe by freeze drying. And so <laughs> it's uh, 60 years later, 65 even, um, and uh, this guy was wrong. Refrigeration is not being replaced. Freeze drying is uh, used only for astronaut ice cream. Um, <laughs> So, but at the risk of being that wrong myself, I feel like refrigeration could be replaced. Um, and so this is just one example, again, of where food preservation might go. This is a company in Santa Barbara called Appeal. Some of you might have heard of them. They've just rolled out their first products, but what they've designed is a coating that extends the the life of food by restricting how much oxygen gets in and how much water gets out. And um, it's a plant-based lipid technology. The guy developed it because he worked in solar panels and he just spent a lot of time watching paint dry on the solar panels. And, <laughs> and while that gave him time to think, but it also gave him an intense knowledge of how to uh, design coatings really well. Um, and so at the moment, it can give you two or three times the natural shelf life of the item. If it gets to four times, that's refrigeration. Four times is the benchmark for refrigeration. The founder of this company thinks he can get there. So he thinks you will be able to achieve the same results, the same shelf life as refrigeration, using his coating at ambient temperature. And I feel like what's interesting about that is, OK, so what does the food system based on the coating at ambient temperature look like? What happens to our logistics systems? What happens to where things are grown? What happens to our definition of freshness? Um, will it become something that we measure completely differently? Um, so yes, I find these thoughts about what the future of the cryosphere will look like uh, pretty cool. <laughs> to imagine, and <laughs> that is where I'm going to leave you tonight. Uh, there is obviously a lot to say. Um, there's a Q&A, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Let's uh, yeah. pull out, please. There you go. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. And um, 
It's so interesting. The uh, I, I mean, I think you said this in there. It is. Um, it, it is. It is an attempt to conquer time in a way that that uh, with with changing how how long we have avail access to food, but then that allows the conquering of space because exactly. then it can be. Um, spread around, and and it seems like it also uh, at the same time, for us as consumers, it changes the way it it blurs our sense of time because we don't know how long something would last if it's not in the refrigerator. We also we lose touch with a sense of the seasons and what's right. fresh when. Um, do, is or that is something else you explore? In and there? a sense a sense of that, for example. I mean, your meat is dead, hopefully, um, but your your fruit and vegetables, they are still breathing. They're, they are respiring, um, and, and they don't know just because you picked them that something bad has happened. And so, <laughs> um, so that's and it. And they're different from, from <laughs> item to item uh, as well, yeah. I would expect, yeah. And yeah. so that's kind of fascinating to me. I don't, I, I, again, I feel like, you know, and we were joking about how you're, bok cho you're not going to heaven because you let bok choy rot in your right, right, refrigerator right, right, drawer. Yeah. I, I've just revealed too much, yes, yeah, sorry. Right. But, but I feel like once you know your bok choy is sort of slowly dying, it gives you, I, it gives me a different relationship. Yeah, it's well. There's empathy just before all the guilt. Um, <laughs> the, so, so, so that's a, that's actually a good segue that, to touch uh, briefly on on the auto drawing, mm -hmm. which is that you have been uh, getting what you call fridge selfies yeah. um, from from people of, of taking a, a, a look at what's inside their ice box. And I and I did this, and and that's where this came from is. Um, I felt I realized the secret shames of it's like oh I haven't I bought that I don't know how many months ago and I haven't opened it yet and like there's it's something very, that's waiting um, a little too long in the back etc. It's a very uh, personal thing I think to share a picture of your fridge and there's actually so in in my chapter that so I will go through the cold chain from warehouse to fridge to what we eat, et cetera. And so in the fridge chapter, there's actually a guy who is the fridge dating guru. <laughs> and um, you can tell this is a really serious intellectual book, but uh, he matches people based on their fridge <laughs> selfies. <laughs> Um, and he claims a really high success rate. So if you are looking for love and, you know, Tinder's wow. not working for you. Wow. Um, there you go. So uh, tell us more about your, uh, first of all, uh, t what's the title of the book and when uh, it'll be out next year? Well, I have to f finish writing it first. So, um, but... Uh, so if we get good qu good questions here, yeah. they may make it into the book. So that's oh, an yes. extra incentive for your questions in just a minute. Um, it's called The Birth of Cool. <laughs> and uh, and the I think the, the hope was that it would be out next fall. We will see if that will happen. And tell us more about your... Penguin Press, though. Penguin Press. So... so Tell us more about your research. Were you um, were you going in the field? Were you going all over the world? And and uh, tell tell us some of the more interesting aspects, if you would, of what you've been through in the last several years working on this. Well, so I've been into a lot of refrigerated uh, warehouses, and actually, what is quite funny is often. Uh, my long-suffering husband, Jeff, who is in the front row here, will come with me um, because we'll be driving through the middle of the country and I'll be like, oh, there's an amazing refrigerated warehouse here. <laughs> we have to visit. Um, and uh, Jeff gets really cold really easily. <laughs> so he just, uh, he's uh, made me promise that my next book will be about hot tubs in the tropics. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's... <laughs> because this has been a very torturous process for him. But no, I, I'm, one fun thing I did this past spring was I actually worked in a refrigerated warehouse um, uh, for a while, which was, so in my chapter looking at ref refrigerated warehouses and meat and refrigeration and meat, um, I look at both meat, the meat we eat, but also what happens to humans as they work in refrigerated spaces. It's actually a very difficult environment to work in, um, and a lot of people just don't make it. Uh, the people, people just don't show up the next day, and I can understand why. There are um, four things. That this is the sort of medical mnemonic for what happens to people as they get too cold. It's called the umbles. They grumble, 
stumble, fumble, and mumble. <laughs> and so those are the sort of diagnostic symptoms. Of, so, there, uh, so there's there are neuro, neuro there, things that are happening? Well, cold slows things down. Mm -hmm. And it's doing that to you, too. And there is nothing more um, sort of visceral than working in a refrigerated warehouse to understand cold's time-stopping powers because, A, the day lasts even longer than when you're sitting in front of your computer staring at a bank blank page, which is really long. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, you slow, and you don't even realize you're slowing. You're moving slower. I mean, when you first come out on the floor and you're swapping shifts with the people before you, this pace they are moving at after eight hours in the in the freezer room, it's which which adds a whole other level to that zombie chicken thing. <laughs> totally. It's like the zombie humans yeah. moving the zombie chickens around. Um, what's what's the biggest upside for this uh, refrigerated system? So are are we I, I, in terms of nutrients, in terms of fresh food that that's getting to people? Is is that something you're able to? Um, is is there a sort of a summary of what's because because obviously the uh, the climate toll is is a super negative uh, thing mm -hmm. but but what's what's the what's the biggest benefit that we're getting from this or you know is it just largely driven by bigger profits from uh, from from consolidated brands wanting to sell their stuff everywhere well don't don't forget that quarter inch of height that was a, <laughs> that's yeah. a key benefit but no I think there's a huge amount in nutri in in nutritional terms and actually there is a, there have been studies of this, which nutrients have increased and which have decreased. What I think is interesting is the microbiome work because obviously as our, as our consumption of uh, cold stored foods has gone up, our consumption of traditionally preserved foods has actually gone down and that may um, have had a negative effect. I know you're looking for upside, I'm sorry, um, on our microbiome, but it has undoubtedly had a, 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 benef a benefit in terms of vitamins and access to animal protein, um, for sure. The in animal protein has a lot of benefits going for it. Um, and uh, Rose has the microphone there, so get her attention if you have a, a question. But I, I also want to say the other upside yeah. is just uh, the sheer delight of eating. I mean, think about cold. Cold is great as a sensation. I mean, ice drinks, ice cream, it's a whole world of pleasure. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're t uh, upside, I mean, the cocktails here are a testament to <laughs> the beauty of cold. M many, many of them locally made, by the way, just so you know, we're, we're trying to respond to this. Um, I, I want to, before we take a first audience question, um, I want to go back for a second to the, to the refrigeration climate problem, mm -hmm. the super greenhouse gases. Can you just, for, for those who, who don't know the specifics of it, um, is it about the production? Is it about how they're disposed of and, and being released? What's, what, how, how exactly are these... Um, it's not the production, the it's the all refrigeration systems leak a certain amount of refrigerant, they just can't not. That can be 2% in a really well-maintained, really modern system, but it's more typically like 15% a year that you're losing, so that's quite a bit. So that's what's happening. And then there's the disposal, which again, there are protocols around that you might not follow if you are looking to cut corners. And, and so, you know, we had... We can switch refrigerants, and that has been seen to happen. I mean, look at the ozone um, layer and us switching wholesale to HFCs instead, which turn out to be these super greenhouse grasses. But we've done it once. We can, we can do it again. Um, I think what's interesting about the refrigerant problem is that those HFCs are particularly popular in the developing world because the systems that run them are easier to run and cheaper to install. And so it's another one of those situations where it's like, no, you have to have our um, more expensive and harder to run system because uh, we had 100 years of refrigeration and now you can't even have one, <laughs> you know. OK, I think we've got a question back here. Do you have any sense of the impact if you could prove that guy right and talk people into freeze dried instead of frozen? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, this this edible coating is sort of the equivalent of that. And I have not done this, but my intention is to sort of 
math it out a little and see what would happen. Um, at, at least with one, they, they're starting with avocados. So I figured I would just kind of play it out with avocados um, and see what would be saved. But I, I mean, I think it would be a lot. The Japanese snow cooling people did figure out they s the first that that how much they've saved. So they have published on that. I don't have the numbers with me, but they have published exactly how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions they've saved and money, um, which is a lot too. So you can you, if you if you look for the Japanese snow cooling project online, you can see those numbers. All right, we have another. There we go. Hi there. Um, how much does the food cold chain compare to the climate cold, like the refrigeration that's used for, for the ace, food. Right, right. Human cooling and then also computer cooling is sure. a big thing and factory cooling. Um, food cooling is the biggest chunk of that. I, uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now and I am notoriously bad with recalling numbers when they're not in front of me, so I'm not going to give you any. But um, at the moment, food cooling is the biggest chunk of that. I believe that's projected to change. Uh, I mean, unsurprisingly, the world is getting warmer. Human cooling is, is, is yeah. Uh, and so, so um, you're doing this, uh, and thanks. When was the, when did you say that last book was that, that looked at refrigeration? The 1953. The 50, OK, so we're due for an update. This is great. Uh, <laughs> Every half century, we should check in on this, folks. There was an audience uh, once. There yeah, will be again. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and, and so this is a great uh, kind of view and to bring it all together and look at that from standpoint. In terms of fixing it, uh, obviously, there are a lot of different parts to this system. Um, I wonder, are there, is there governance? Are there regulations that affect pieces of this that could be a knob that are turned? Is that something that we need? Or are there other, um, are, are there things that you've seen in, in, in your research of this? Um, if, if we want to address this, and maybe, maybe the way to ask this is, um, what would be, is, is there a particular, is it, is the refrigerant, what, what aspects should we target first, especially on the, the climate side, if we want to make this more efficient and still get the benefits, but maybe um, re reduce some of those environmental costs? Well, I mean, so as I say, this UN Sustainable Cooling for All panel got started last September, and they have um, uh, the Kigali Agreement on reducing uh, the refrigerant use, and obviously we've all signed up for our um, Paris uh, Accord targets, except those of us who haven't. And At the least we're in California, <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. there are... M at that level, there are mechanisms in place. Um, I think everyone will say who looked at the CFC success that those mechanisms would not have worked without a lot of investment and a lot of enforcement. And whether the investment and the enforcement are there is a whole other question. Um, because I am not a policy person, the thing that I think is people need to care about refrigeration before we do anything about refrigeration. People. Uh, the hole in the ozone layer was a thing. I, I, I was a kid at the time, but you could care about it because it was it was very um, visceral. And my my thought, you know, I said I want to reintroduce you to your refrigerator. I feel like it is an invisible system at the moment, and I would like to make it visible. And that is part of the work of doing something about it too. And and the fact that you have a, a region here full of foodies. And talking about farm to table, and they have completely elided this middle step, that's ridiculous. These people care about farm to table, and they don't care about refrigeration. They should. So that's, that's at least my part of it. Have we got another question, I think? Yeah. Hi. I know you're not the apologist for this lipid-based coating, but I bet you know more, right? Uh, I was like, first of all, can I put this on my skin? Um, <laughs> I would like to bathe in this stuff. And then second of all, can I buy into it? I mean, so I, I am the apologist for it. I'm just trying not to be in a how, model of journalistic restraint. How labor intensive is it? And how do you remove it once you get a vegetable or a fruit? Oh, it's edible, because it's made from the lipids inside the, the, the avocado seed. Does it, so does it alter the flavor? Is this like avocado oil lipid on your fruits and vegetables? Doesn't. 
Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I know, you too can buy shares. No. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a it's not a publicly traded company. I have not been, but no. I I mean I I think it's um, I think it's exciting. And also one thing I did think that the guy had done that was really smart was actually study the avocado uh, chain from start to finish, down to sort of assembling a replica of the avocado packing houses to figure out and and you know replicas of avocado packaging and all sorts of things to understand exactly how his system could fit. Um, and so I just, I, I, I gave it, initially I was like, uh, you know, you're a journalist, you get a press release about this, you're like, Ugh, another stupid thing. But, uh, which is what whole journalists think, I think, for <laughs> every press release, <laughs> more or less. But I, when I visited, I was pretty excited. <laughs> Another question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you, uh, it looked like you did some research into these kind of interstitial cooling spaces. It doesn't seem like everything needs to be frozen or even down to 35 degrees. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of the root cellar. Yeah. Um, and I've been in places where, you know, in colder climates, you can actually dig into the ground and you can have frozen cellars. Um, but it seems like there's a lot of room for these things and, and eggs that actually don't need to be refrigerated if you don't wash them the right. way that Americans like to wash yeah. them. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of room for relieving the refrigeration stress on the world with some of these things that don't need to be quite as cold as other things. Oh yeah, and there's some public service sort of journalism to be done too around the, the way, the, what people put in their fridges. There's sort of this yeah. illusion now. I think such, you know, a sort of, Again, it's that cold storage banquet has succeeded 10 times over, and now people think the fridge is the safest place to put everything, um, like everything, like goldfish crackers. And, and, and it's just, it, you don't need two fridges. You really don't, basically. I mean, unless you're protecting against ants, I just want to just say, <laughs> it is there good for There are other that. ways yeah, to do that, true, Michael. Um, uh, there's one in the front. Here. Yeah, here you go. Um, I'm just curious, I feel like you talked mostly about like when you imagine the lipid coating or some of these other things, or even just like, we're talking about individual refrigerators, but I'm curious thinking about like, you know, there's obviously been a lot of coverage of like banana, like the whole process that bananas have to go through to pr precisely preserve and then ripen and all, and there's other examples of produce and things that have to be in on mass, like stored and then set to a certain position before being put in the store. So how, if we were to say, like, change refrigeration, it, that if you go back a step from the individual fridge to, like, sort of like the mass uh, cargo shipping container scale, what mm -hmm. happens? Well, so, I mean, take bananas. If you, the reason, bana the, so bananas are an amazingly refrigerated fruit, which is weird because you don't, put bananas in your fridge at home, but they have to be transported under refrigeration. And until they could be, bananas were um, extremely rare, so rare that, you know, Scientific American published instructions on how to peel a banana. Um, and, uh, you know, there was, there, was, there was a lot of, when, the, when refrigeration started and bananas started becoming common, people did trip on banana peels and have to be, warned not to throw their bananas on the ground. And l cities did pass ordinances against it. I mean, all of this banana panic was real. So, but it, it only works because of refrigeration and then because when you bring, you harvest the bananas unripe, which is how you're able to transport them for so long, and then you ripen them using a, a, a plant hormone called ethylene, and uh, then you get them to the store where we don't refrigerate them. But the only reason you need refrigeration is because you're transporting them unripe. If you could transport them ripe without them turning into mush, then you wouldn't need the ripening rooms. So if the lipid coating, not to sound like an apologist for the lipid coating, <laughs> but there is, there, there is, there, but if a, a, a way was found to transport the, the bananas and give them that extended shelf life so that you could harvest them when they were ripe, then you wouldn't need any of the rest of the infrastructure. You would still need the shipping, but it wouldn't be refrigerated uh, shipping. So, I mean, if you're gonna eat bananas, 
the, although I like to think refrigeration is at the center of the food system, there is, and it is, there, there are some things, you know, if you're going to eat things that are tropical, they are going to be shipped. There are still some elements of the food system that are going to need to be fixed after we fix refrigeration, but at least they wouldn't be sh being shipped under refrigeration. And uh, the, the, another thing that that, that brings to mind, and it's, we, we had another talk uh, a few months back uh, by Shazina Tari, who's, who's an um, environmental scientist who looks at the psychology uh, also of, of consumers. And one of the things she finds is that, that we don't understand the cost of various, using various utilities. And in a way, we also don't understand this for food, and especially by way of how it interacts with this artificial cryosphere, meaning that if you've got something that is out of season, for instance, you are you are costing the environment more, um, no matter what you are paying for it um, to, to, to do that. Um, uh, but maybe this is interesting, uh, a good way to segue into talking about some of your other work. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about Gastropod, because Gastropod, it seems like, is... Um, is the podcast that you do. You want to tell us a little bit about this? Because it, you, you are doing this job a little bit of, of informing your audience about the realities of some of the food, the backstories and the science behind some of the food. Um, tell us about it and tell us maybe how you see it sort of fitting into um, you know, the, the, the same reason why you, do, uh, you wrote this book. Well, so Gastropod is a podcast that I co-host with uh, Cynthia Graber and that I started because we met on a food and farming fellowship at UC Berkeley, thanks to the glorious Malia in the front row here. Um, so you, we have her to thank for the existence of this podcast. But uh, it basically is the same impetus um, as the book, just uh, there's so much we don't understand about our food. Let's go down a rabbit hole. But with Gastropod, we do it with a, with a single topic each week. So um, the episode that we are putting out this coming Tuesday that we're wrapping right now, so it's in my mind, is, well, why do we eat the animals we do? This simple question that you think, how can that sustain a podcast? But it, uh, an entire episode of a podcast, but it turns out all of our theories, like, oh, well, it must be because these are the ones we were able to domesticate. Well, why were these the ones we were able to domesticate? It, it turns out these, none of these reasons quite add up. And, and there's a lot of sort of, yeah, basically it's the same thing as, as refrigeration. You just kind of keep digging until all the weird, um, unexpected stuff comes out, and that's what I do as a uh, writer, and I guess that's what I do as a, as a podcaster, too. I mean, we just did one on an episode on mangoes, and the, and the, the sort of question was, what, why, why are Indian mangoes so delicious and American mangoes so disgusting and disappointing? Not disgusting, disappointing. I'll be fair. Um, and, uh, and so that turns out to involve, you know, a whole series of things and Harley Davidson's and George W. Bush and the fact that Americans like red shiny things and it just, it, 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 there's a whole sort of story built into it that you then make an episode. And this episode drops on... Oh, the mango one, you can... You oh, can, the mango one's already out as there. As you okay, walk good. out of here, you can hit subscribe. All right, all right. <laughs> On your phones. <laughs> or you can hang out a little bit longer and ask Nikki some questions here, uh, right here. Well, uh, so I think th this project and, and Gastropod as well, um, you're doing this kind of Anthropocene journalism, really, at, at, the, at this point. I mean, it feels like, I mean, does it, does it feel like there's a different, um, uh, hmm. a different kind of, of um, Perspective. It, it it feels like that's that's a that's a constant through here. Is is that it's it's um, there's there's an awareness of um, it's not just the thing in front of us, but it's a larger system and it, and it's a history that sort of led to this point. I think that's always what it is with me. Is oh, it's a larger system and it's a story you didn't know about how we got here, yeah. and that maybe doesn't necessarily make actually that much sense once you know it, and then once you know that. Well, it could be different. And that moment where you're like, well, it could be different is the most exciting moment. And then you let other people go away and figure out how to make it different, people who have skills in that department. But I like the part where you realize the, because there is no real good reason for how we, or there are a series of sort of slightly random reasons for how we got to what we have, 
it means we could easily blow it all up and have a better system or a different system. All right, great. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, let's have another big round of applause. Thank you. For Nikki. Uh, I'd, I'd like to present you with the, the Long Now Challenge coin to thank you for, uh, thank for you. speaking for us, remind you to seize the millennium, and all of you to seize the millennium, and to seize another drink, and stick around, please, and, and talk more with Nikki. She's going to yeah. be sticking around. Thanks once again for, for coming out, and really appreciate it. One more big thank round of applause. You.